And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March meeting of the Ozaki Radio Club. Nice to see all of you this evening, and hope you're all doing well. And with that, let's uh, move to our program. Chuck W9KR is going to talk to us tonight about a tube tester that he has refurbished. And those of you that have worked on old radios are, or are old enough yourself to remember when vacuum tubes were new, you know how important a tube tester is when doing your troubleshooting and evaluation. So Chuck, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chuck. I, I've been uh, very interested in vacuum tube radios since the 1960s. And it's been fun for me to fix some um, old broadcast radios and amateur radio equipment. And um, here's where it all started. Uh, what I'm showing you is a very, very old um, emission tester uh, vacuum tube, tube unit. And um, I, I bought this for, oh gosh, 14 or $15 plus probably $30 in shipping. Yeah, that's the way it works out. And uh, got that back in the late nineties and um, got quite a kick out of refinishing the cabinet, which was actually a nice wooden cabinet. Now, here's sort of the puzzle with this circuitry that was used. That uh, RCA 954 tube was used as a rectifier and it supplied all of the uh, B plus voltage required to operate the tube tester. Um, that's a unique experience. Here's the tube. Um, it's a pentode. It was originally produced in 1933 and in this tester, it was used as a half wave rectifier. Um, it was sort of a puzzle uh, as to why they did that, but at the end of World War II, there was just a ton of electronics that were being thrown out at uh, a nickel on the dollar, it seems. But um, this is what they ended up producing. Um, it's a Superior Instruments model TV-11. And they started selling them in 1949. Uh, it wasn't really much of a piece of test equipment. It left a lot of things hanging out on the end of the flagpole. Here's some notes. Uh, it was just a very basic emission tester. Uh, and most emission testers told you very little uh, other than that the filament was working. Um, most sold to do-it-yourselfers who are trying to repair black and white TVs uh, and save money. Um, Later models eliminated the uh, 954 vacuum tube and they put in a 8Y1 metallic rectifier. <coughs> That's also called a selenium rectifier. Um, I paid about $14 for this plus shipping in the late 90s. <clears throat> now here's a better choice. 
this is a um, Hickok model 752 and it's nicknamed the Federal Aviation Administration Tube Tester. I purchased it in um, 2002, 2003, and uh, Hickok made a whole bucket full of these. Uh, they're fully mutual transconductance tube testers. And that means they actually injected a signal onto the control grid and measured the final tube's gain uh, way beyond what that uh, puppy I just showed you a moment ago could ever accomplish. Um, the previous one is something that would be called a souvenir but not a functional piece of test gear. Um, th this, this what I'm gonna be showing you is a step forward. Um, the Federal Admin uh, Aviation Administration wanted a special design, one that could test dual diode triode tubes without resetting the test knobs. So to test both triode halves, um, they had contracted with uh, Hickok to test typical triodes, 12, 18, oh, you see them there on the screen. Um, these 752 model testers were used mostly to test tubes removed from airport radar equipment. Uh, doesn't change anything. They still work phenomenally with the um, radio equipment and broadcast equipment that was uh, common during those times in the years. Now, if you look down at the picture and count over, the first triode could be tested by pushing down on the S5 button, and that would give you a response on the meter. And as long as you hold down that button and go over to the right and press down the S8 button, you would then switch over to the uh, correct connections and be able to test the second half of that dual triode tubes. Um, that's the only one they made. And that was right around 1960 that those uh, first came out. Uh, take everything I say with dates with a grain of salt. Not all of this is going to be within 10%. Um, here's just a quick uh, picture of the old case I brought, uh, excuse me, bought in the uh, years after I originally purchased this. Um, a guy was selling them on eBay for around $175 and I don't know, I like pretty cabinets. So I bought one of these and uh, I've had it in there since 2004, 2005. I really don't remember when, um, but this puppy, if you see the big white sticker in the upper, left-hand corner. Uh, I shipped that off to a um, calibration agency in North Carolina, and they went through the whole thing um, and calibrated it, and uh, it really works nice. I've used this on Collins, S-Line, Collins, uh, 
KWS1, 75A4, 75A2, um, all sorts of uh, equipment and uh, very, very pleased with how well it's worked. Now, um, Pat, you asked me if I should allow interruptions or questions. I'm not sure if I have to touch a knob, but if there's any questions at this point, please fire away, guys. Everyone is muted. So if you want to ask Chuck a question, just unmute yourself and start talking. Uh, Chuck, I'm curious, did you uh, open it up and have to clean any contacts or change any sockets or um, <clears throat> clean the pots or do anything like that? Uh, very good question, Tom. Uh, thanks for asking. And yes, um, I sure did open it up. Um, the, the reason for that was to transfer it from the original black wooden case to the new uh, oak case. However, uh, I chose to replace two electrolytic capacitors that were inside. I did spray the contacts with contact cleaner. Um, I guess I should have taken pictures of how I clean contacts, but um, I guess that's a separate issue. But yes, I did open it up and go through the interior and two electrolytics, the only electrolytics inside this uh, 752 series unit did need to be changed. Back to the group. Uh, Chuck, Fred, a, a, a question. I, I'm curious on, on the professional testers like this Hickok, how often did they issue new roll charts? Was it a, a fairly rare occurrence or did they come out uh, real often? Uh, infrequently. That's the best way to put it. Um, I was able to obtain new printouts for the most recent roll charts. I never used the roll charts inside the cabinet itself because of, I don't know, my worry that I would damage something. But I had booklets uh, in three ring binders with the most recent roll charts. And that's all I ever used during the last 20, 24 years. Back to the group. Where did you get that? Uh, this one I bought on eBay. And when I bought it, it was, uh, oh gosh, $420. And now they're going for over $600. Um, I, I think I mentioned that this uh, was from 20 plus years ago. But uh, as you can see, it's literally spotless. There's not a scratch, a nick, and one of the most important things to me was in this picture, you cannot see it too clearly, but every one of the chrome attachments is spotless. There's no rust, no corrosion, nothing. I wouldn't have bought it if it had corrosion on it. I wanted good stuff. But this is the lower level tester that I have. 
With your permission, if there's no other questions, I'll go on to the next level. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna jump on. Quick question, um, Chuck. Oh gosh, no, I'm gonna go back. Okay, go ahead with the question. Sorry, just curious where you got the case from, the wooden case. Um, good question. The, the, there was a guy selling them in between 2000 and 2005 uh, on eBay. And I paid $175 plus shipping for this case. And it was immaculate. And um, I wasn't retired yet then, but just felt like, okay, I'll spend that money and get this old case. It's beautiful. I still have the original case and I'll talk about that in three to five minutes. Next question. Your wife was still working when you bought that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she sure was. Good question, Tom. Oh boy, I'm in trouble now. I, I hid all this stuff from her when it arrived. <laughs> okay, I'm going on to the next step. Um, here's the light, latest purchase. This is a Hickok 539C. This is what I consider the ultimate tube tester that was ever produced. Okay, that, that's a personal opinion. There's triplet tube testers, star tube testers. All three brands were mutual transconductance testers. Um, this one I got in early June of last year. Um, it's a real beauty. Um, I put hours and hours into cleaning this puppy up. Um, it's, it's big advantage is, let's see if I can do this. Over here, you can set the primary input voltage to the uh, transformer. And many of the other tube testers do that too. And well, I better move the picture. That's the picture. You, you set it to the red line. Now, th the neat part about this whole story is I got this um, at a really good price. This is where you set the bias voltage. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to get to the key point. Oh, gosh, I guess I better back up. When the guy advertised it, he advertised it as something is wrong. And he said, when he put power to it and set this input to the power transformer and then tested the line voltage, they had two different numbers. So he said, repairs are required. Well, he was totally wrong. And I've owned a uh, Hickok 539C manual since like 2005 or 2006. And I had read it about 21 times wishing I had one of these puppies. And uh, so I ended up being the only bidder and I didn't have to sell the house or the car to buy this puppy. Um, 
I've lost where I am on this entire presentation other than, okay, now I got the reminder. Um, the case was in really rough shape. Uh, all of the seams, like you see along these lines, were frayed and lifting up like a quarter to a three eighths of an inch. Um, Loctite makes a glue for the repair of athletic shoes. I bought that and glued down all the seams on every single edge of the cabinet. And then I bought this leather repair uh, stain or finish, and it was made for automotive uh, cars from the 60s. And I bought that and restained all of the uh, cabinet features. And here's a picture. And, oh, that picture is where I actually decided to, to make a presentation. I thought maybe a couple of other you guys would get a kick out of this. Sure hope so. And here's where <clears throat> I finished the third coat of the black dye uh, on the material called Tolex. Tolex was the material used when you guys were in grade school and your parents bought you a clarinet, saxophone, coronet, or whatever, and Fender used that on their big uh, guitar amplifiers. And obviously, Hickok used that also. And here's um, after the third coat and after the, um, uh, oh gosh, I guess I missed that. Well, I don't know where I am. Here we go, the top coat. Um, the finish that I achieved did not match the um, original Hickok. And this stuff, they gave you a choice of a low gloss, mid gloss, or high gloss top coat. And so this was a mid gloss requirement. I put it on and it really did a great job of matching. But going back, now, do you see this mess up right here? Oh, gosh, I got yelled at by dozens of people. But that patch is something I carefully removed. Oh, gosh. I... Okay, guys, give me a moment. All right, I found myself where I am. Do you see that little blue sticker? That's what I peeled off the original um, Hickok cabinet. I was able to use that uh, previously mentioned shoe glue that uh, I used to fix all these seams and went on from there. Um, apologize for my clumsy use of the forward and backward bump buttons. Now, inside the cabinet, there were only two things I had to do. I, I replaced this electrolytic capacitor and a second one that you can't see, but it's hidden down in this area. And uh, these are accessories. 
over the last 22, 24 years, I collected a lot of um, vacuum tube testing accessories. Uh, let's see. Here, here's for you test the tube, it tests good, and you plug it back in, but the friggin' radio still doesn't work. Um, these are extenders. You plug that into the tube socket first, then you plug the tube into this socket, <clears throat> and then you can measure the, the voltages that are actually appearing and it really is a big plus, uh, makes it easier to troubleshoot the radio. And um, these are for vacuum tubes. Uh, I don't know, I guess I'm going fast, but I don't wanna bore the hell out of you either. And this is a um, accessory that plugs into almost any Hickok uh, mutual transconductance tester. Here are manuals for about eight different testers, and they're for compactrons and new vistas. <coughs> I better hurry up or I'm going to get thrown out of the barrel. Um, why do you have a tube tester? Well, you can use it to stack your shoes on. It's a great cabinet. Oh, you can fill the empty cabinet with money or like I do, actually use it to test tubes and old radios. Here's what I started with. <clears throat> That's a shipment I got last uh, October. And it's a SX, Halicrafters, SX62A, and uh, it's out on my workbench. And there's a bucket full of tragically flawed capacitors. All those pink puppies, um, they need replacement. So I replaced them all and uh, went on from there. I uh, chose to use a variac and an ammeter and obviously the plug to originally test the radio because I was told it drew significant current. Um, and I had already replaced all coupling capacitors and all electrolytic capacitors. And um, it, it turned out okay. Now, I reversed a couple of slides here. So the um, uh, verbiage up at the top is out of sequence, but uh, it took me four attempts to properly um, install a new line cord. And that's because of an error in the Halicrafters manual. They said, place the um, uh, tuning capacitor in the fully meshed position and then string the land cord, a line cord, excuse me. Well, maybe I should have said dial cord. And that was opposite of the correct way of doing it. You needed to have the um, tuning capacitor fully open. Well, wasted a lot of line cord in getting to the right point. Um, I've been babbling incoherently here for the last seven, eight minutes. Uh, were there any questions that might be appropriate at this point in time? I have a question, Chuck. Um, you and I have talked about tube testers a little bit. I have two of them. 
One of them is a very old basic one, one's more modern, probably from the 50s or something. I don't remember the names of either of them. I, the very old one is capable of testing a four-prong tube, uh, such as a 80 or something like that, but the new one is not, the newer one. And I was wondering, is there some way that I can put an adapter on the newer one so that it would test the old tubes? Or do I have to keep both of the tube testers? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I really have to know the brand name uh, to give you anything close to accurate. But um, if they're older tube testers, and uh, well, I guess I'd say I wouldn't trust them for more than a nickel's worth of information. Um, I'm happy to test tubes for anyone for free. And as I already mentioned, these are what I have are top of the line um, mutual transconductance tube testers. So if you have a model number, I, I could give you a, a better response, but only take my answers for being 60% accurate. <laughs> that, that's the safest fate way for me to respond. Okay. Any so other questions or yeah, responses? Well, uh, yeah, I have another one. I have another one, and that is, does the um, the Hickox that you like, are they capable of testing a four-prong tube, uh, like such as an 80? Um, yes, the, the ones that I have, but um, you better go and mortgage your house to buy one. Any other questions? Yeah, Chuck, this is Tom Casey, 901Y. So like, like that radio that you have there, is this, you got shipped to you. Are you fixing radios for people or is this just uh, club members or, or what are these radios that you have there? Um, Tom, yeah, thanks for the question. I've been fixing radios for people since about 1966. And um, I, I've got two sitting here right now that are ready to be delivered back to customers. And probably why I get a lot of activity is I don't charge for labor. I just charge, if you have a bad part, um, you pay for the bad part, specifically vacuum tubes. And beyond that, um, I fix them because I love doing it. <laughs> That's the best way to phrase it. Uh, Chuck, this is Tom again. Uh, I restored an SX-62. <clears throat> and the reason I did is when we visited Dayton, Ohio, the presidential planes, uh, the... <clears throat> Uh, Air Force One of uh, Kennedy's had an SX-62 in it. Now, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I found one locally and have restored it. And uh, I enjoy it very much. It sits in the garage uh, <clears throat> and it does FM quite well as well. Well, thank you for sharing that, Tom. That's really, really uh, neat to hear about. Thank you. I got a couple of more pictures. Um, should I continue or are there other questions? Go ahead, Chuck. Okay, I'm gonna charge ahead. Um, this is showing with the new dial string and probably the more important um, part of this picture. If you notice, the first 
first uh, three to five inches of the cabinet is, uh, or the, excuse me, the chassis is polished. And I really like clean radios. I won't buy one or I won't buy a tube tester if it's all corroded and uh, rusted to hell. Um, so I proceeded to try and clean up this chassis. Um, here's a little detail. I used simple green, didn't work. I used crud cutter, it didn't work. I used 409, it didn't work. And then the more unique scrubbing bubbles didn't work. They didn't touch anything. And I followed an order by VM and P naphtha, uh, acetone, xylene, and then methyl ethyl ketone. None of them worked. And guys, I don't know who out there is a chemical engineer, but there's something called the carry butanol value. It's the strength of a aromatic solvent. Methyl ethyl ketone is at the top number one or number two on the list. And it wouldn't touch the uh, stains and corrosion on the uh, SX62 chassis. So then I started pondering steel wool. And I thought, that's really a dumb choice. But uh, I, I sat there pondering it for days. Well, actually better part of two weeks. And then I decided I'm going to use it. And you can see here it is. Uh, four odd steel wool, an extremely fine product. And I charged along. You can see I even unscrewed the uh, power supply choke and audio output transformer and was scrubbing along with the steel wool. And as I progressed, it was like, eight seconds of scrubbing and it made it clean and neat. Okay, this isn't a good picture, but it did. Oh, well, wait a minute. There's all this uh, steel wool that's fragmenting and falling all over the place. Um, I had to keep wiping it off the magnets. Stan, this is gonna be your moment of glory. Uh, on the left is the clean area, on the right is the dirty area, and there were like 12 or 14 pilot light bulb bulbs, and um, I finally got to the uh, variable capacitor. Stan, those are the magnets that I bought from the... Uh, club auction, uh, golly, four or five years ago. Um, I, I was using two of those plus the probe that I showed you, a mo showed the group a moment ago. And yeah, I think the bidding started at 20 at 25 cents. Tom did that. And huh, I must have paid a fortune like a dollar, dollar 25, but we'll keep moving. Um, here's the summary. I finished reassembling uh, the SX62 and it started up just fine. Um, the um, amp gauge showed no issues with the power supply drain. Uh, the radio worked immediately on AM, so I was happy. I then switched band. Uh, I went up to FM, worked perfectly. 
but as I switched bands back down, I thought I heard some arcing. Yep, I sure did. Well, it, it frustrated me for three or four days, but I did get um, a spray can, one of those $17 spray cans of deoxid D5, uh, sprayed off the band switch, and then used uh, compressed air cans for cleaning the uh, keyboards, and everything was fine. So it worked out. Um, that's pretty much the end of my story, other than the refinishing. Uh, this is a front plate, a item that I sanded down, sanded off all of the silk screened activity, and then I made decals for it. Um, and uh, I applied the decals then sprayed the assembly with clear lacquer and bingo. Here's what it looked like at the end. Um, that, that's something that I was really happy with. Now, th th this is a messed up sequence of events, uh, several verbal errors, um, but here it comes. Okay, um, I've got this all set up to do the RF and IF alignment. I'm going to show you a little bit of it um, using a, another radio uh, today. It's a six tube with an RF amplifier. Um, over here, I've got a um, Hewlett Packard 8656B as in Baker. RF signal generator, and I do have it set for the IF frequency 455 kilohertz. And yesterday I did three of the four transformers, and uh, I selected a minus 30 dBm for the output frequency, and that worked out real well. Now over here, I'm going to select. AM for the uh, modulation, and we'll run it up to 50 60 percent. Uh, that worked pretty good. <clears throat> now, over here, you can now hear it. That's the um, <clears throat> thousand hertz modulation uh, signal, and the RF signal generator allows me to connect an external uh, frequency input if I want to do something other than 400 or 1000 hertz for modulation. So now I'm going to try and uh, get my probe uh, connected and got to use a headlight here. Okay. I got it in there and hopefully you can see the signal. I'm turning the wand and you can see it growing. So it was a little bit off. Okay. Uh, I went past the peak and backed up and uh, that's all there is to doing a RF and or IF alignment, and this is the last step in the four-step IF alignment on this particular radio. End of story. Okay, guys. Uh, sorry it took so long. Uh, when I did it by myself, it was like a 25-minute presentation. I guess I was fumbling along here. Sorry for any of the delays that I created. Um, that's it. One question. How did you make the decals for the uh, <clears throat> uh, redoing the panel? Uh, Tom, I, I did a Google search. I, I've done this twice 
in the last 20 years or so. And um, I, I purchased for like $12 a packet of 10 sheets of uh, decal material. And you can then print them out using a inkjet printer. However, you got to then spray the um, resulting product with what, what I used was um, clear lacquer, Rust-Oleum, and let it try for 24 hours. And that, that did a perfect job. I was extremely happy. And um, somehow I bumped into uh, Jim Russell, W9JRX, who also lives in Port Washington, as I do, and supplied him with a couple of the sheets. And he put that on some uh, applications that he needed. That's the whole story. There's a company called Radio Days, spelled D-A-Z-E, that uh, makes decal sets for some radios. I don't know if they have them for the SX-62 or not, but uh, they do make them for a lot of radios for just the situation Chuck was describing when you have to refinish and you have to take the silk screening off. Uh, they're not real expensive, but they, uh, and they will uh, keep you from having to come up with your own artwork or find some artwork somewhere. And um, they, they're pretty easy to find. So if, if you're thinking about doing that, you, you do have a couple of choices of uh, you can make your own or you can uh, buy a set ready to go. So kind of interesting. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chuck. And let's hold it uh, there with the questions and get to the business portion of the meeting. And then Chuck, if you're going to be around uh, after the meeting, we can set up a... Uh, a uh, breakout room and see if anybody has any more questions. Very good. I'll be here. All right. Thank you. So nice presentation. Thank you.